Thank you, Sam. Good morning. Welcome to Sunday worship at the First Unitarian Universalist Society of Burlington. Sunday today is Sunday, July 24th, 2022. I'm Jeff Duke, a member of the Worship Associates team, and I'm so glad to be a part of today's service with our ministerial intern, Rowan Van Ness. As a Unitarian Universalist faith community here in the heart of Burlington, we warmly welcome all people to the shared work of building beloved community and making meaning in our lives. This religious community is guided not by a creed, but by a set of principles that express our commitment to each other and to shared values that include love, compassion, service, justice, and truth. As part of that commitment to truth, we acknowledge that our UU Meeting House and our homes, our schools, and places of work are built on the traditional and unceded lands of the Western Abenaki people. We acknowledge the hardship and violence the Abenaki have endured because of colonialism and white supremacy. We give thanks for the opportunity to share in this place, to protect it, and to care for all those who live here. Friends, whatever it took you to get here, whatever burdens and joys you are carrying, all belongs, and so do you. Welcome. Creating Sunday worship services takes many hands. Please, pardon me, please join me in extending thanks to all those who are making this service possible. Special thanks to director of music James Stewart and musician Sam Weitzel, to our tech team members Woody Fulton, Xander Herrick, Memphis Everest, and Tom Hyde, and our audiovisual coordinator Michael Wright. Thanks to our facilities manager David McFeeters. Thank you to Bob Furrer for our flowers, and thank you to our society administrator Mary Williams for making everything tick. I do have a few announcements this morning. After this morning's service, we will have an in-person coffee hour um, outside in, the, in, the, uh, in front of the meeting house, and I hope you will join us. Our online Zoom coffee hour will resume in August. Martha Mulpas and I are facilitating a new radical welcoming chalice circle. We invite you to join us as we ex together explore the ideas and practices of radical welcoming through readings and reflections and support each other as we challenge our own comfort zones and consider how to, be, how to build beloved community that has room for all people. Our next meeting is July 28th, this coming Thursday from 7 to 8.30 p.m. on Zoom. And you can find information to join on our website, uusociety.org. The FUUSB membership team invites interested members to serve as official welcome ambassadors at Saturday, sorry, at Sunday in-person services. The membership team believes that the quality of our welcome is one of the most precious features of our society. You can see more information about how to get involved in our e-news. Hopefully, as you entered the, um, the sanctuary this morning, uh, you were offered an index card, or one or more, and there should be, I'm reading the wrong announcement, my apologies. Uh, you may note that in the pew in front of you, there is a welcome card. Uh, if you are a uh, visitor or want more information about our society, you can fill out that welcome card and drop it in the um, offering when, we, when he, we accept the offering. And I wanted to mention that we have a guest outside, Rick Hubbard, an octogenarian, is walking across the country to uh, raise awareness and fix our democracy uh, in the style of Granny D, who you may remember. Um, he's got a table outside, and he's seeking some volunteers uh, potentially to travel with him. And you can find more information 
uh, by, for those of us who are here, by um, stopping by the table and chatting with him this morning after the service, or by visiting www.fixourdemocracy.us. I hope you'll, you'll check him out. It's a little warm this morning, um, but it's also wonderful to see so many faces here in the meeting house today. If you're a newcomer or, or just visiting, would you be brave and raise your hand so we can extend a special welcome to you if this is your first time? Welcome. It's great to see you. Thank you. I invite us all now to pause for a moment, maybe look around, notice where you are, to feel yourself in this space or at home, if you're watching or when you watch later, take a breath and know that you are welcome here just as you are. And now, if you would join me in saying the words as we light our chalice. We kindle this flame to remind ourselves of the light of truth the warmth of community, and the fire of commitment. Thank you, Jeff. Our call to worship this morning comes from our new poet laureate, poet laureate uh, the poet uh, Ada Limon. I think that the main question that I'm always asking is this. How do we live in the world? How do we live? Because with the amount of loss and suffering that is all around us all the time, our own inevitable demise, the inevitable loss of loved ones, the damage to the planet, how do we live in that reality, yet still do the daily work of praise and presence and gratitude without driving ourselves mad? I'm constantly trying to look for that balance, like, how do I see the big picture and hold the world's pain and at the same time see all of the bright edges of joy? Come, let us worship together. Please rise in body and or spirit and join me in singing hymn 112 in the Gray Hymn Book. Do you hear, O oh my friend, in the place where you stand, through the sky, through the land? Do you hear, do you hear, in the heights, on the plain, in the vale, on the main, in the sun, in the rain? Do you hear, do you hear, through the roar, through the rain? Through the throng, through the crush, do you hear in the hush of your soul, of your soul? Hear the cry, be won't still, hear the hearts call to me, hear a sigh starting to in your soul, in your soul. From the place where you stand, to the 
Now I have a story to share with you all. It's a wisdom tale. This version has been uh, written by John Muth, and it's based on a story by Leo Tolstoy, and I've adapted it slightly further. The story is called The Three Questions. There once was a boy named Nikolai who sometimes felt uncertain about the right way to act. I want to be a good person, he told his friends, but I don't always know the best way to do that. Nikolai's friends understood, and they wanted to help him. If only I could find the answers to three questions, Nikolai continued, then I would always know what to do. When is the best time to do things? Who is the most important one? And what is the right thing to do? Nikolai's friends considered these three questions. Then Sonia the heron answered first. To know the best time to do things, one must plan in advance, she said. Gogol, the monkey who'd been rooting around in the leaves looking for something good to eat, said, you'll know when to do things if you just pay close attention. Then Pushkin, the dog, who was just dozing off, rolled over, and he said, you can't pay attention to everything yourself. You've got to have a pack to keep watch and help you decide when to do things. For example, Gogol, a coconut is about to fall on your head. Nikolai thought for a moment. Then he asked his second question. Who is the most important one? Those who are closest to heaven, said Sonia as she flew, circling up higher and higher into the sky. Those who know how to heal the sick, said Gogol as he was rubbing his bruised noggin. Those who make the rules, growled Pushkin. Nikolai thought some more. Then he asked his third question. What is the right thing to do? Flying, said Sonia. Having fun all the time, laughed Gogol. Fighting, barked Pushkin right away. Then Nikolai thought for a long while. He loved his friends. He knew they were all trying to help him get the best answers possible. But the answers didn't seem quite right for him. And then an idea came to him. I know, he thought. I'll ask Leo, the turtle. He has lived a very long time, as it seems like many turtles in stories have. Surely he will know the answer I am looking for. So Nikolai hiked high up into the mountains where the old turtle lived. Then when Nikolai arrived, he found Leo digging in his garden. The turtle was old and digging was hard for him. I have three questions and I've came, come to ask for your help, Nikolai said. When is the best time to do things? Who is the most important one? And what is the right thing to do? Leo listened carefully, but he only smiled. Then he went on digging. You must be tired, Nikolai said at last. Let me help you. The old turtle gave his friend a shovel, and Nikolai kept digging until the rows were finished, because it was easier for a young boy to dig than for an old turtle. But just as he finished, a so storm blew in. The wind blew wildly, and the rain burst from darkened clouds. And as they were moving towards the cottage for shelter, Nikolai suddenly heard a cry for help. Running down the path, he found a panda whose leg had been injured by a tree that had fallen in the storm. Carefully, Nikolai picked her up and carried her into Leo's house and made a splint for her out of a stick of bamboo. The storm raged on, banging on the doors and the windows, and Leo smiled to see what Nikolai had done. The next morning, the sun was warm, the birds were chirping, and all was well with the world. The panda's leg was healing nicely, 
and she thanked Nikolai for, for saving her. At that moment, Sonia, Gogol, and Pushkin arrived to make sure that everyone had made it okay through the storm, was doing okay. Nikolai felt a great peace inside himself. He had wonderful friends, and he'd saved the panda. But he also felt disappointed. He still had not found satisfying answers to his three questions. So he asked Leo one more time. The old turtle turned to the boy. But your questions have been answered, he said. They have, asked the boy. Well, yesterday, if you'd not stayed to help me dig my garden, you wouldn't have heard the panda's cries for help in the storm. Therefore, the most important time was the time you spent digging in my garden. Later, when you found the injured panda, the most important time was the time that you spent helping mend her leg. The most important one was the panda, and the most important thing to do was to take care of her and to make her safe. Remember then that there is only one important time, and that time is now. The most important one is always the one that you're with. And the most important thing to do is to do good for the one who is standing by your side. For these, my dear boy, are the answers to what is most important in the world. So the story ends. As you may have anticipated for a question box service, we are inviting folks to ask questions today. Of course, that's a standard standing invitation for Unitarian Universalists. Um, but what we would like to ask is that you would take a moment to think about what questions you have. What would you like to ask Rowan, our ministerial intern? Questions big or small? theological or practical, you, as I started to mention before, uh, you likely received uh, an index card on your way in uh, to the service. If you don't have one, you're welcome to raise a hand and we can get a card or cards to you. And there should be pens in the pews in front of you so you can write a question or two. Um, and if you'd write the question or two on the index cards, we'll collect them after the meditation, which I'm about to do. And then later in the service, Rowan will respond to as many as we have time for. And so now I think we'll have a little bit of music to spur our, our deeper thoughts and, and questions. I'd like to share a poem. It's called A Gift by Denise Levertoff from her collection, Sands of the Well. Just when you seem to yourself nothing but a flimsy web of questions, you are given the questions of others to hold in the emptiness of your hands, songbird eggs, that can still hatch 
if you keep them warm. Butterflies opening and closing themselves in your cupped palms, trusting you not to injure their scintillant fur, their dust. You are given the questions of others as if they were answers to all you ask. Yes, perhaps this gift is your answer. As we let these words settle into us, this music, let us deepen together into a time of meditation. We will breathe together and then hold a moment of silence. After the silence, or at any time later in the service, you may come forward to light a candle to mark a joy or sorrow, and you can drop your question cards in the basket on that table. Let us begin with four deep breaths. One for the solid earth beneath us. One for the changing sky above us. One for the living waters all around us. And one for the sacred fire within us. Come now into the place of peace and holy listening. As we enter this moment of silence, let us open our hearts and our mind's ear and listen.
And Sam, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jeb Spaulding, and I'm a relatively freshly minted member of your Board of Trustees, and here to say a few words about the offering for this week. Um, and as I lead into that, uh, I want to say for the new folks, normally uh, our offering, we take half to sustain our mission and, and our assets, and half to support an, a local organization that might be doing anything from uh, housing to uh, climate action to mental health services, all, all kinds of things. Uh, and that's done 11 months out of the year. Uh, one month, the month of July, we normally take the offering to help us sustain our own mission. And uh, that's incredibly important. Uh, I got to sit in on a, uh, a workshop for uh, UUs across the country. It was basically in, in terms of a, the search for a new settled m uh, minister. but. Uh, it was talking about the challenges that Unitarian Universalist uh, societies and all or, or many uh, religious uh, organizations are having across the country with everything from, uh, you know, membership to donations in the, in the pandemic to uh, inflationary needs. And uh, it's important that we support our organization. And, and for me as a member of the board, um, you know, I think what's important is, is, is variety. It's different things for different folks, but for me, I, I think that's when this building was actually built. I know it was over 200 years ago. And for me, it's like a, it's a beacon towards the uh, Vermont and, and all the visitors that come here of, of the long arc towards justice. Uh, and I'm proud of that. Then it gets down to the personal, and for me, it's like, okay, you know, how do I become a better person? It takes us a long time to figure out how to do that. Uh, but this is an important place for a lot of folks. So our offering this month uh, will be sustaining us, and we'll get to the, uh, the dedication in a second. It also allows us to actually do important work, in the case I'm going to mention, to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, and we recently adopted an eight, eighth principle which uh, part of was to, you know, accountably dismantle racism and oppression. And uh, our racial justice team, and I see Zoe Hart here, brought a proposal to the Board of Trustees that we donate $50,000 unrestricted to the Richard Kemp Center, which is a, pro a project to the, raci um, the Racial Justice Network, I think is what their official name is. And uh, that's a big deal for us and a big deal for, for them and very fitting in memory of uh, Richard Kemp. Uh, some of you knew him well for a long time. I actually used to run into him about 30 years ago when I was a relatively young state senator, and he would come down and speak with uh, a, a beautiful smile, but a lot of power, and, and not just for uh, BIPOC-type issues, but all issues of, of, of justice and inequality. And uh, it's, it's really a, a proud moment for this society to be able to put $50,000 in it. Now, I mentioned the, the struggles we're having, not struggles, but the challenges we have with our finances. But uh, in this case, we got a loan through the COVID probe, some of the federal assistance, and it was a loan to sustain staff and uh, retain staff and, and payroll and, and just stay in business. But part of the loan was if you followed the instructions correctly, it would be forgiven. So I don't really remember what the amount of it was, but it, I, my recollection is somewhere around a couple, couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and it's one-time money, or maybe it, was, maybe it was half of that, but it was, it was a sizable amount of money. But uh, 
That is one-time money that really won't be the kind of thing you'd want to use to sustain your staff. It's a perfect opportunity to do something important for the community, and I say put our money where our mouth is behind our new eighth principles. So on behalf of the Board of Trustees, really want to thank Zoe and the rest of the team that brought that proposal forward uh, and really uh, am, am convinced it will make a big difference. Now to our offering for this week. Um, you know, we, we uh, have various ways of doing it. Uh, if you're here, you can come up and uh, put an offering in the, in the, in the basket. Uh, you can go to our website online, or you can text Steeple, at, I, I wrote it down here, 73256. So those are the ways you can do it. If you feel like uh, contributing, that would be most appreciated. If not the right time, no problem there. But as we uh, move into uh, the offertory, I'd, I'd like to have you join me with our, our regular uh, words that uh, introduces our, our offering. Well, maybe I'm, I'll, I'll say them anyway, but with gratitude, we dedicate these gifts in the service of our mission to inspire spiritual growth, care for each other and our community, to seek truth and act for justice. So now is our time for your questions. And Jeff has so kindly vetted all of what you've <laughs> put in your index cards and passed along, and he'll be posing them to me, and yes. I'll answer them for you. Final answers, I'm sure. Terry Gross, I am not, but I'll do my best. Um, so the, the, I thought maybe we'd start off with a, with a theological question. What is the difference between living by a creed and living to your principles? I, I, that is a question I've never come across before. Um, a creed is a statement that has often been developed by a group of people. So I think of like the 
um, Nicene Council or um, something like that. I think they're most common in Christianity, or the word creed, I think, is most often used in a Christian context. Um, and it usually has a very explicit set of words. Um, and for a creedal tradition, a group of people is all promising to live by a certain creed. So maybe to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior might be an aspect of a creed. Um, and I think to live according to one's own principles might be something that is more independently developed. Um, or it could be, in the context of Unitarian Universalism, we have a shared set of principles, though I imagine that each of you probably has additional principles that, that you are living up to that are important to you. Um, so I suppose that for some people, living according to the creed may be in line with their own personal set of principles, and for other people, a creed may not be in line with their principles. So I think as long as uh, those two are different, then your answer is gonna be different. And if they're the same, if the creed, if, if having Jesus as your Lord and Savior, for example, calls you to act according to the principles in which you believe, then they might be one and the same. So I don't think they're always different or always the same. That's my answer for today. <laughs> um, if we do not subscribe to any creed, dogma, or belief system, then who or what are we worshiping during our Sunday worship services? Did you all coordinate? This sounds like we've got like a, a list here. Maybe Jeff is just organizing them well. Um, worship, I've often heard the root of meaning is uh, something like to what we give worth. I've also heard it something along the lines of to, to what do we bind ourselves. And so when I think about that, I think about what is important to us. Um, so if we're in a non-creedal tradition, what are the principles, what are the issues, what are the um, ethics, what are the causes, justice issues, uh, what are all of those things that stir our hearts? Um, that can be one aspect of, of what we're spending our time doing here together. Another aspect that I think is, is true for me and for many of us is to think about um, how do we call ourselves into connection with something greater than ourselves? And for some people that may be God, and for some people that may be community, that may be the universe, the cosmos, that may be, um, I, I have a moment from middle school summer band camp of playing a concert on a stage at the end of a week of, of playing music and just feeling so connected to the other people with whom I was creating music to the timelessness of music, to the, to the, to the world beyond. So I, th I think individually we find those moments in different places and what we call those. I think sometimes part of what we do here is to try and recall those moments or find or seek those, those connections to something greater than ourselves, to know that we can't be here only as singular people, but that we we must be in relationship with each other and with something greater. Shifting gears, what is your hope for your daughter as a new mom? So for, for those of you who don't know, I have a, a daughter who's five months old, so she's quite, quite small. Um, we named her Seneca, and part of why we chose that name was because of the Seneca Falls Convention, the, the start of what's commonly recognized as the start of the women's rights movement in the United States. Um, it's also been a place for um, abolition work, social justice work since then, 
even though it's a tiny little town in New York. It was a stop on the Underground Railroad. And part of, part of my hope for her is that she can know that, that change is possible, that the world that we have right now isn't the same world that has ever, has always been here or will always be here, but that we are continuing to work for change and that change has happened um, and continues to be possible. So I, I hope that she can hold on to that. And there's a follow-up and your hope for all children. Ah, I hope all children can know that too. <laughs> uh, I also hope for all children um, and all adults and all people that everyone can feel a sense of love and belonging. I think that is um, really crucial and um, not as accessed today as I think it, it may have been in other times and places. And, um, and I, think it's, I, th I think that that sense of longing, belonging, um, and acceptance, acceptance of oneself, but also of, of one another, um, would, would go a long way for healing a lot of the challenges in our world. Maybe we'd consume less stuff if we could just accept ourselves and each other and not try and fill some of those voids. This will be a quick one. Not. Uh, <laughs> when I see or think of the other side, those who see the world differently than I do, I see people I believe are at heart afraid. Their fear leads to anger and anger to hate. I believe our only hope to healing our divided country is relationship, but where or how to begin? That, that feels connected to me. Um, I think part of that is, comes from self-acceptance and um, letting ourselves be connected to, to, to what is true for us. Um, I, think, I think allowing that acceptance makes us less likely to come out of a place of defensiveness when we're in dialogue with one another. And I think that the more grounded that we can be in ourselves, then the, the better able we are to receive and be in conversation with another person. And I'd like to think that the more able that we're able to show up holy and grounded, that we're able to start opening ourselves up to why might this truth be true for someone else, even if it's different than my own truth, and to imagine that they are coming from a place of, of some wisdom, and that so are we, so are each of us, and that none of us can see the entirety of anything from our own standpoint. And so when we can allow ourselves to be grounded and okay with not knowing everything, but okay with what it is that, that is true for ourselves and to feel okay in that and to hear another perspective openly, then I think that true dialogue can happen um, and I think a lot of times it's a lot easier to be certain of what it is that I believe and to want to convince everyone else what I believe is true. Um, and I think that when we, when we come together with that certainty and without openness or listening, that that's when um, some of the, the real tension, hatred, um, rubbing comes together. But when we come from real relationship and, re and actual curiosity, that there's, there, there's more opportunity for, for change on all sides, for everyone to, to consider um, something new. There's probably more to that than I'm thinking of in this moment, but that's my starting place. Thank you. Um, 
uh, we, uh, Unitarian Universalists, as well as lots of other institutions, have um, members, have heroes who are part of our history that we sometimes celebrate. Um, and we come more and more to understand that you know, ev everyone is a complex uh, person and sometimes these people have done really good and really bad things at the same time. Um, it's not as enough to say they were just products of their times, they were smart and forward-looking enough to see the wrongs they were promoting. But how should we somehow um, honor them or make reparations for them? Uh, are there other ways that we can acknowledge their flaws and their, the harm that they've caused, but still hold on to them? Do we need to cancel them? Uh, how do we respond to that? This is a, an excellent and challenging question. And I, I'm guessing that it's one that many of us grapple with. I'm hearing this question as predominantly concerned with historical people as opposed to what do we do with living people whose work or art or music or fill in the blank politics we support and then we learn something challenging or horrendous about something they've done. Um, in the context of someone historical who's done both good and both bad, I think about a couple things. One is that all of us as humans do both good and both bad, both miss the mark. Um, and so I think if we hold any one person as entirely good or entirely bad, um, we miss the mark. And I think part of that is that when we hold that dichotomy, we're likely to hold that dichotomy for ourselves. And so that we're more likely to, to view ourselves as wholly good or wholly bad. And if we make a mistake, we're more likely to see ourselves as no longer worthy of love. And, and I'm wrestling with this in the context of our, the universalist side of our ancestors. And so Unitarianism and Universalism came together in 1961 and merged. And our Universalist forebearers believed in universal salvation, the idea that everyone ultimately would end up in heaven or whatever that afterward place is, if there is one, that we'd all end up in the same place. And some of them believed that that happened immediately, that everyone just died and you know, ended up in the same good place. And others of them believed that it was incremental, that no one would spend an eternity in hell, but some people may spend a little bit of time there before they got promoted to heaven. And I think that most Unitarian Universalists today are not overly concerned with the afterlife. Um, I don't hear a lot of questions or concern about, about that in the way that I think previous generations may have dwelled more on that. But I think that that question still holds resonances of um, how do we hold both the goodness and, should I say, evil um, that, that historical people have done. And I think that when we know of it, I think we can name it. I think that our society continues to be influenced and benefit from historical people who have done good and have also done bad. Um, I'm also thinking about specific examples like um, Thomas Jefferson, and there used to be a Unitarian Universalist district um, in the South that was called the Thomas Jefferson District, and they chose to rename themselves to move away from the association of him um, knowing the harm that he had done 
um, to enslaved peoples, um, peoples who'd been enslaved. And so I think that, um, that, that holding people with complexity and knowing that we are, are both benefiting from their goodness and to the extent that we can to make up for the legacy of badness um, somewhere in there um, we, we must do both and and ignoring the totality of the good or the bad is not going to serve us well I think a lot more thought could go into that question <laughs> thank you Ed. we have a few more but I think we are out of time for this morning Oh goodness, that was more fun than I expected. So thank you all for your questions and um, I, I will definitely look through and hold on to, to them and, uh, and pass them along to Tricia too. Maybe, maybe they will inspire future sermons. Now we're at another hymn. So please rise in body and or spirit as you are able. And join me in singing hymn 1014, which is a hymn whose title has changed after learning more. So we now sing Answering the Call of Love instead of Standing on the Side of Love to account for ableism and those who are not able to stand. seated. Please join me in the chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. 
These we carry in our hearts and share with the world until we are together again. Our benediction comes from the 19th century Unitarian minister, the Reverend Theodore Parker. Be ours a religion like sunshine goes everywhere. It's temple, all space. It's shrine, the good heart. It's creed, all truth. It's ritual, works of love. It's profession of faith, divine living. Go in peace. <laughs>